and uh, thank you very much. Um, there's a, there's a, a little line at the beginning of this book which says, I have made a gift to mine enemies, I have written a book. Um, uh, I'm not sure where it comes from Machiavelli, I couldn't actually trace it so I put it anon. But uh, that's slightly the nervous thought in the back of my mind in writing a book at this stage in my career, which is, needless to say, a rather long and rambling one. Um, and that reminds me to make clear that why, why did you write the book? Well, not for, to get political preferment. I think I'm the wrong age. <laughs> and anyway, I'm probably the wrong sex. Um, so it's not for that reason. Was it to become a bestseller and make money? No, because there is no sex or restaurant go or food or gardening <laughs> or mystery or aristocracy or toffism in it at all. So those are not the reasons. Actually, it's just a simple proposition I wanted to put into the political debate of this nation. And the proposition is that we're now moving uh, worldwide into a completely new international landscape, a vast new network of, of connectivity of an intensity and detail that's never happened before in history, changing the nature of of international relations quite radically and the way that one handles power in international relations. Indeed, examples of that occur every day, including at this minute. The rise of the, what's so-called rise of the rest, which is the growing, not necessarily the decline of the Western nonsense, but uh, a rise of the power and influence and significance of vast new countries of Asia and Africa and Latin America. Um, a very different pattern from even five years ago. And the story of this book is that in this new situation, first of all, countries have got to adjust, and second, a country like this one, ours is uniquely placed to uh, adjust. It's got all the assets to do so. We've got vast potential. We've inherited, rather as a sort of item from the attic, because it's been neglected, the lucky legacy of the fantastic Commonwealth Network. Two and a half billion people, a third of the human race, all using... English as their working language, all adopting a lot of our British origin systems, judicial systems, accountancy systems, scientific standards, the lot. Um, a fantastic network, not really used properly, not developed the way we should. And I try to sort of ask myself in this book, what's holding us back from using this fantastic range of soft power assets? This ha happened to be a thing that I was putting a plug for something else, that I'm chair of a Lord's Committee that's looking at this same question. I wrote the book for I started on the committee. But uh, we've had a fantastic range of evidence and witnesses in that committee, vast submissions from all around the world, certainly all around this country, uh, giving various views. But before I, we'd had this, I tried to set down what I thought was holding us back. And I'm just going to run through the sort of six main things which are in the book and then um, uh, wait for a few arrows to be shot in my direction, which I think is the proper thing for you to do. Um, one of uh, the sort of complaint that Maynard Keynes used to have, and his real quarrel wasn't with the monetaries versus the Keynesians or the, the uh, economists, it was with those who refused to accept what was really happening. They simply weren't, they were either blind to or refused to recognize the vast change in the conditions that he was facing and were facing today, which are completely different to five years ago. Two, obviously, we're not, we're not yet on top of the European situation. We had the brilliant speech of David Cameron, the, uh, the Bloomberg speech, uh, but somehow, so far, a party hasn't formed round it. The real intellectual depth hasn't been injected into it. Uh, there's a whole chapter in my book called The Party of January 23rd, rather hopefully that such a party of reform can come into being with more power than, say, the party of reforms of 1832 and the <coughs> periods had in this country. Thirdly, uh, I follow very much William Hague's adage about our relations with America. They do need resetting. We still bang on in the language of the, last, of the last century about it. William rightly said the relationship should be solid, not slavish. I think summed it up beautifully. Fourthly, and I, this, is, this is where I may not get any further because you may shout me down, it is a, is a chapter or two built on previous books I've written about the economics profession and how it has let us down, <laughs> frankly. It has engulfed in an endless civil war about uh, uh, managing and steering this economy or modern economies, which are actually not related to what is going on, the Keynesian point again. Anyway, it's in the book to explain 
why um, an economic analysis has not helped this country find its confidence in its new position in the new network. And in a world, incidentally, in which the whole pattern of supply, the supply chains of trade have changed and snaked their way into the world system in a completely different way to what you would imagine from listening to people talking about bilateral trade and nations. Fifthly, there is the fiasco of energy policy, where we somehow mm -hmm. succeeded, despite having masses of primary and uh, distributed energy in this country, we succeeded in creating a rather miserable result, the so-called trilemma. Um, we have affordability, reliability, and decarbonisation. We've failed on all three. It's certainly not affordable. Uh, it's certainly not going to be reliable. And, of course, decarbonisation, um, if you take into account our full carbon footprint, has been a disaster. The whole of Europe, really, is going backwards on the green front as we burn more and more coal. And it's, I argue in the book, and this will make me very unpopular, that the green zealotry on the way it's been tackled has actually set back the green cause quite badly, instead of taking it forward as I would like to see. Then the next one is <laughs> the need, as I may have mentioned the Commonwealth, but the need to invigorate the UK commitment to the Commonwealth. I even rather rudely say it's time Britain rejoined the Commonwealth uh, in this book. Um, really... People say, well, why? What isn't a big market in next door to us? Of course it's a big market next door to us. But the real growth, if you look at the figures, is in the services export earnings. 45% of our export earnings come from services now. Where do services really play well? Not, I'm afraid, in the single market, because there isn't much of a single market here locally. They play well throughout the English working language speaking world and are rapidly expanding with enormous effect and huge gain to this country's reputation and earnings throughout the Commonwealth, and of course the neighbouring countries to the Commonwealth, to which it is the gateway, like the really big players of Asia and Africa. Um, then next one, two more, that we have to understand, and I've tried to argue this again in the book, resting very much on Barbara Tuchman and her wonderful analysis of the march of folly in the past, when the whole establishment embraces some story and it turns out to be a disaster. We have to understand that the nature of democracy has now changed. It's in the street. We all thought the Arab Street was going to the Arab Spring was going to be a spring with liberty and democracy. It turns out that if you put power into the street, it just fragments into a vast range of different grievances and different challenges and permanent instability and volatility. And a lot of our language seems to imply that just around the road there's a package called democracy, Jefferson style or Westminster style that we can load into the system and it'll all be accepted in due course. And that isn't the world anymore. Yeah. We have there's a completely new set of thinking about the nature of, of popular support and how it's mobilized for any direction. And finally, I, we, I, my plea in this book is for a better narrative about this island's purpose and direction. We have a good story to tell. It is told from time to time, but I think we could do very much better in bringing this nation together and heading off the threats to our own union, namely be having Scotland locked off, which is an absurd idea. Indeed, at some stage, I argue that far from going that way, we should now be thinking, looking again at very, very positive noises coming from the direction of Dublin, uh, the Irish Republic, where, of course, the Queen was marvellously received, where um, was at least one person in this room knows we've lent them a lot of money at very nice rates. Um, and uh, there's a lot of rethinking going on in Dublin about even if they're not going to line up with the, with the Brits after several hundred years of antagonism, the entry to the Commonwealth, this new Commonwealth, which isn't necessarily Anglo-centric, and joining this network of exchange and capital flows and business, which is growing at such a rate between Commonwealth countries, is something worth considering. So we might end up with a stronger British Isles and not a weaker one yeah. once we've got over the hump with the Scots. So I think I've said enough to indicate that this is a, an optimist's book. Uh, perhaps you'll say that I, um, I'm not, uh, I should have known right to be an optimist. I'm not young enough to know everything. Um, and, uh, but one tries and accumulates it all. And that's, I think, the story which, which Aside from political parties, people who believe in this island and its possibilities and its history and its potential should now be thinking about adopting to take us forward. Thank you very much. Thank you.
uh, Lord has very kindly agreed to <coughs> ask questions. Uh, we, uh, we like to think of uh, as ourselves as optimists, so um, if there are any pessimists here, then may I, David? Yes. Um, um, you made reference to the institutions the, in the world, the United Nations and uh, European Union, and very politely, uh, it was implicit that credibility is not very high. Now, the credibility of the Commonwealth is clearly untouched in a sense in, uh, in recent years. There have been lots of discussions in the past, but now it is a credible institution. How can you make political capital out of that credibility? Can uh, something be unifying, uh, for instance, the three or soon to be four parties uh, in the UK? Um, can, can one really build on that proposition that the Commonwealth is a viable and credible institution? Well, uh, only if one starts from a, a different point of view, that this, we're not talking about alternatives to uh, governmentally blessed uh, international organizations like the EU with the top-down sector. We're not talking about that. But the Commonwealth starts from being a different thing, which is why it fits into the age of connectivity and the age of weaker government power and dispersed power uh, and uh, strength in the street. As a, as a, the Commonwealth fits into that because it is, uh, as uh, the Queen keeps reminding us, a, um, a family. And it's a family of interests and lobbies and, and uh, groups and <coughs> children and education and universities and uh, court procedures and uh, habits and uh, every conceivable kind of lobby and interest from A to Z. There are 82 official Commonwealth organizations, none of which uh, need, because they're really sort of bottom-up, uh, um, self-propelling or self-assembling organizations, they don't need uh, a great sort of treaty on top of them or a great new schema of things. And it is, it is extraordinary how despite all the treaties in the world, and despite all the talks of spheres of influence, although as William Hague rightly said on Monday, we've, looked, we've passed the age of spheres of influence, despite all that, the Commonwealth interaction uh, has been given a blood for transfusion by, uh, by the rise of the internet and connectivity. So that's happening anyway. A lot of this is happening anyway. You don't need a governmental initiative to crown it. Uh, it is a different animal entirely to what would the founding fathers of the uh, European common market or community or union uh, we're aiming for. And I think just as the Commonwealth is rising because it's not dominated by secretariats, so the poor old European Union has got to adjust itself rather sharply to meet with this, to cope with this world. Yeah, yeah. Um, and EU reform really does become the flag of all parties, as far as I make out. I don't understand why people make out there's a, a row about, this is naivety, I know. Why are we all rowing about the European Union half the time? Everyone agrees there should be European reform, including the three quarters of Europe. Mm -hmm. so. uh, David, isn't, it, isn't the reality is, if we assume we're going to get over the hurdle of the next general election, the Prime Minister is going to get bogged down negotiating with Europe, like all his predecessors, he's going to come back with sweet damn all. Uh, and then the party is going to split when he advises to vote to stay in Europe. Uh, can you see any way we're going to get out of this? Uh, not least um, with the very points you make about Commonwealth, Latin America, the wider world, which was what Pitt yeah. was involved with in the first place. Well, Jake, it's, um, it's in the book. There's two chapters answering your question. <laughs> <laughs> By the book. <laughs> By the book. But the, the answer is most certainly that you know, we could talk about the, the media obsessed with this idea of a, a negotiation between Britain and the rest of the European Union to grab our goodies off the shelf, get the low-hanging fruit. It isn't going to be like that. But we're, we're talking about European reform, which requires a huge input of intellectual effort far beyond governments and officials, and uh, requires really the best brains of this island and indeed of Europe to reconstruct and, uh, a Europe that really is going to work in the 21st and 22nd centuries. And that is what we, in London, ought to be able to take the lead in doing. And the Prime Minister's speech, 23rd January, did indicate that that's the way we go. But uh, I think that, the, although it was a rallying call, there's not enough rallying. If people think, oh, we'll leave it to the Foreign Office, they'll sort it out. It's, this is a much bigger task than any official can deliver. We're talking about we want the engineers, the physicists, the best academics, the best brain power, all to be as equivalent. I used to go and interview Jean Monnet when I was a young journalist. 
and uh, he, you know, he said this is all going to be done by round the dinner table or by by thinking by the best brains. I'm not going to wait for governments to build the Europe of the 20th 20th century. We're going to build it without governments, which was something that backfired in the end. But um, it is it is through intellectual profundity and really understanding how nations interrelate and how Europe's going to work that we're going to reform Europe. And that's what we should be doing in the next four years. I hope the Brits will have common sense and give it a 60-40 majority in 2017. I think they will. Uh, John David, first of all, congratulations on being the most vocal political champion of the Commonwealth since I think the days of Bob Menzies and Lord Beaverbrook. Mm -hmm. Hasn't been anybody really much in the intervening period to say the kind of things you are now saying. But when you were Minister for the Commonwealth, what was your thing you were proudest of actually doing? <coughs> and secondly, if we were looking for things which really started to make the Commonwealth meaningful, how about a better visa system, uh, obviously a preferential system, for people from the Commonwealth? Yeah, well, um, on, on the second one, without uh, improper leaks and so on, I've, I've mentioned I was chairing this soft bar committee, every witness we've had, and that's on the record, has raised this issue of different visa arrangements for the very different kinds of immigrants we're all ranging from billionaires at one extreme to extreme to able young students and would-be future leaders and business people on the other. So, uh, and those who want to come here to do a genuine job. So it's, it's, uh, that's a very well point, taken point. I don't mention it much in the book, but it's, you're quite right, it's uh, central to the issue. What went on uh, in the Foreign Office, which I greatly enjoyed, marvellous people there, but I did discover very early on by looking through old records of the Tory people, there was, a, there was a coup attempt, a failed coup, in, uh, nine, in 2000, I think, in 2003, to get the word Commonwealth abolished from the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. It failed, it was defeated, and the C remained there. So my first task, this sounds a bit ethereal, but this is, was to, uh, uh, with the full support of the marvellous William, to, to get say we're going to put the C back into the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. Get the idea going again, show that Britain wasn't actually completely. See, a lot of people think, and I'm afraid this applies to the Foreign Office establishment, uh, many members of it. 1972, we were told, sorry, chaps, the destiny is in Europe. The big show is in Europe. All the growth is going to be in Europe. That's where the growth is. You can forget the rest because they're slow growing, they're basket cases, they just want more aid. That's all aboard. We'll turn out with an old Ted made a thousand speeches saying that he was trying to do what he could for the Commonwealth, but basically our destiny was in Europe. And that's 1972. Now, the Foreign Office only got to that state of mind after a lot of arguing. They were one of the last departments to agree to that. Once they were converted, they became, like all converts, zealots. And they have stuck with it for 40 years. Uh, where are we now? 1917, 1972, 2012, 13, 14, 42 years and moving away from that mindset to the understanding that Europe is important, but unfortunately it happens to be stagnant, unfortunately it's got a lot of problems it's going to struggle with for many years to come, and that the big growth markets, <coughs> the huge growth in our exports, in, in the world development, in technology, in science, are going to be outside Europe. To change to that mindset is something I'm just trying to give a nudge at. But that's, that's the story of tomorrow, and it is, that's why I think again, quoting her Majesty quite freely, because she's held it together over the dark years. Uh, she says it's, in many ways, the platform of the future. Yes, may, maybe a short comment, in, rather than the question of what, what Lord Hull said about the Commonwealth and, and Ireland. Uh, I was in, in Dublin in, in October and helped to organise a roundtable event, Commonwealth roundtable event, in Mansion House, which, like in London, is the Mansion House of the Lord Mayor of Dublin. And round the table we had Sinn Féin, we had the Irish political parties and we had the Ulster Unionists at a Commonwealth meeting, which I think was pretty unheard of. So I think just to reinforce what Lord Hull is saying about the opportunities vis-à-vis -vis Ireland, uh, but I think in addition to that, uh, a lot of countries are actually queuing up to join the Commonwealth in Africa, uh, in Asia and elsewhere. I think that is a, another sign of its vitality that so many countries are wanting to join the organisation in addition to the, the existing ones. That is, that's a very good point, uh, Carl, as well. That you, I didn't mention it all. I do in the book. In fact, the book, book begins... It, is really inspired by, I don't know whether the ambassador of Algeria is here, and I never considered Algeria as, as a natural, uh, having a natural affinity with the Commonwealth. 
but uh, they were the ones who rung up one morning and said, what about this Commonwealth? We'd like to get closer to it, please. It's, it seems to be the club of preference. Everyone thinks it's the place to be. It's a place where somehow we've noticed countries that have joined recently, like Mozambique, have suddenly turned much more magnetic for inward investment. Suddenly they brought back best people from Harvard and from Goldman Sachs. They've discovered a lot of new resources. They've got a much better government down there. Could we have some of this magic? So uh, that really led me to the view that um, even though there are problems in the Commonwealth, heaven knows we've seen some of them at government level in recent months, uh, there was a, underlying all that, there is a, a tremendous knitting together going on and people want to be part of it. They really do. And uh, that raises all sorts of questions I don't want to go into now about. It's a club, and like all clubs it has an inner committee, and there are different views about dis uh, dilution, who should come in, who shouldn't just a load of problems if we bring in X and so on. All that goes on, you'd expect. But basically, as Carl says, if a lot of people want to join it, there must be something in it. Unless there are any further questions, um, I'd like to ask you to join me in thanking Lord Howe for the splendid speech.